everyone. Welcome to the MuseCore Cafe. Um, not the MuseCore Cafe. This is the Music Masterclass. I know what I'm doing. Um, so sorry, I'm a, a little late getting started, getting uh, trying to just get some materials together. Um, so this is Thursday, March 4th. My name is Mark Sabatella, director of the Mastering MuseCore School. And this is my weekly series where I talk about uh, making music. So the MuseCore Cafe is where I talk about using MuseCore and uh, we make a little music along the way. Here it's kind of the other way around. So um, what I want to do, and for those of you who are new, because I expect that there's some newcomers here, because I finally figured out how to get past some spam filters, I think. So uh, some of you just saw a notification about this for the first time, and that's great. <clears throat> so one thing I will say also uh, before going further, I sent out a notification to everyone on my list about this music masterclass, but usually I don't send that out to everyone, just the people who specifically ask for it. So you will want to come over to my site. Um, let me go to the chat. Where did I have it here? And uh, you'll want to go to my site and um, let me pin the message. Come on, pin, pin. There's the pin button. There we go. Um, so you'll want to go there and then actually be sure to enroll in this Music Masterclass. It's free. It just puts you, and you're already on a list probably, uh, but it, it just makes sure that you will get mailings specific to the Music Masterclass. And there's some, like discussion areas and things like that also. Um, so anyhow, uh, if you want to keep informed about future ones, uh, that's that's the way to do it. So I see that lots of people here checking in from all over the world, and it's always so great to see this. I see Utah, I see uh, I see the Netherlands, and uh, and this is just always so fun. Um, so um, there's a couple different things that I wanted to do uh, today, but actually I uh, was struggling because I now I'm only now remembering where the thing was that I'm looking for. Um, I, I have so many things going on with my uh, on my computer that it's um, often hard to find what I'm looking for when I'm looking for it. Right. So uh, give me bear with me a moment. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the idea of fugues because I've mentioned that counterpoint is a subject that I'm teaching in college right now this semester. And uh, I want to be able to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, what a fugue is and how it works. And uh, for this purpose, I'm going to take Actually, the fugue that, let me think, this is B minor is 24, 23. Uh, so if I think, if I, I'm, I'm trying to think of which one is going to be the B flat major prelude and fugue. That's the one that I actually worked up like when I was in high school and got good at playing. Oh, that won't do very well at all to open it in here. Um, so what folder are we in? Um, scores. Score. MuseCore 2, open WTC. Okay, MuseCore 2. Okay, so this <clears throat> will be the uh, B-flat major fugue. And I just want to walk through a little bit about it, because last time we looked at a, a, a piece that was submitted that was uh, aiming for a fugue type of uh, place, and I mentioned, well, okay, so it doesn't like technically fit in the de standard definition of a fugue in a lot of ways. And I talked about what some of those things were that it could mean, but now I want to talk about what it really could mean more specifically uh, by looking at some Bach, right? Um, open WTC, and I think, again, it will be number 21, if I'm doing my math right. Yeah, there we go. All right. So let me play you a little bit of the B-flat major fugue, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Let me actually switch to my presentation mode, which kind of clears away some of the clutter. And uh, let's let's listen to some music here. Let me uh, actually before I start playing, make sure I don't have any uh, anything particular else going on. All right, very cool. Um, okay, so here we go.
Okay, so that is the Bach B flat major major fugue. So if or at least one of the B-flat major fugues he wrote in his life. Uh, and for those who don't know, the Well-Tempered Clavier it was a series of preludes and fugues that Bach wrote, one in each major and minor key, kind of to prove it could be done, because the whole idea of writing keyboard music in every different key was kind of new in Bach's day, because they were still figuring out tuning systems that would actually allow you to play in all keys, because traditionally, originally, the way things were designed, the way the interval ratio, the uh, frequency ratios worked in intervals, some keys really just, you didn't want to make music in. So, um, uh, and well-tempered was a way of tuning a piano or any keyboard instrument in a way that made it feasible. So, uh, so that's the prelude. And the fugue usually goes faster than that, too. I, I didn't put a tempo uh, setting on it, so it played wherever it wanted. And I'm actually going to uh, give me one moment to, to flip to a vertical view of my pages, because I'm going to find that more useful when I'm doing these demonstrations here. Okay, so This is the fugue, and so what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through a little bit about the form of the piece so that you understand, well, what does it really mean to be a fugue? And the thing is, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are relevant whether you're writing a fugue or not, um, and because uh, you, you, they're good compositional techniques, but it's, it's how they typically get combined that kind of defines a fugue. So if I were to define a fugue, first of all, it's a piece that uses imitative counterpoint, that uses, um, that has a subject, its main theme that's stated right here at the beginning. And actually, let me go ahead and crank up the tempo a little bit. Let me add in a... Okay, that's too fast, but that is the main theme, which would be called the subject in a fugue. And um, so we see that in one of the voices. Now, this is a three-voice fugue. There's uh, all Bach fugues that are four. There's some that are five or even more voices. Um, but uh, you, you wouldn't play more than five voices for uh, on the piano. You don't have enough fingers to pull that off. But you can, you can write fugues in more voices uh, and score it for like uh, some sort of ensemble. So the thing is that that theme right there, doo -doo -doo -bum, right, that is in the key of B flat. And because it's a, a B flat fugue, what then happens is the second voice of the three voices is going to enter. In this case, you can see it's entering um, <clears throat> below the first voice, right? The first voice entered at F. The second voice is entering at B flat. And the thing is, you look at that and say, well, okay, it entered starting a fifth below, but it's not identical. The first original statement of that subject was um, F, G, F, B flat, right? It was go up a step, come down a step, and then leap up a fourth. But the answer is starting on the B flat and then going one, starting on B flat, B flat, up a third, down a third, up a fifth. So the intervals have been altered. This is what is called a tonal answer as opposed to a real answer. Um, depending on the structure of your melody and where it sits in the scale, sometimes a real answer makes sense, sometimes a tonal answer makes more sense. And the, the, the reason you do what's called a tonal answer is to keep it in the key. Like this piece, do, 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 dum. If you want to think of that solfege wise, sol, la, sol, do. Or um, since I know a lot of people in Europe are used to those being note names, let me do it with uh, numbers. Five, six, five, one. It's outlining and then three. The whole first measure is outlining the one chord, the key of B flat. Well, if I took that whole thing and just literally started on B flat, now it would be outlining an the key of E flat. It would be B, B flat, C, B flat, E flat. It would feel like we've changed to E flat, and we don't do that. We hint at another key without explicitly going to that other key, and the key we go to is not E flat. It's not the key of the four. It's the five. So F is really, like this piece, this first opening melody is suggesting 
a uh, B flat tonality, the answer when it comes in is going to suggest F. It's going to suggest the five is the is the normal, and but it suggests it in a way where we adjust the interval so it still feels like we're in the original key. So we either adjust the melody to feel like it's the five chord but still in the original key, or like we did here where we're just still outlining the one chord. So the specifics of how that is done are very um, uh, kind of, there's all these very specific rules for how Bach would do this and so forth. But the idea of a fugue doesn't depend on those rules. That's my, my statement about rules. Uh, many, many of you have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again because it, it always bears repeating and it's always a fun demonstration. They are not rules that tell me what I must or must not do. They are the rule like the law of gravity. That tells me if I drop my phone, it falls. The law of gravity doesn't care if I drop my phone. It just tells me what'll happen. So the, uh, I don't care if you write a real answer or a tonal answer. It's that when you write a real answer, it in a in this melody, had he done that, it would have felt like it was moving to a different key, and he didn't want that. If he had wanted that, then he would have he would have uh, he would have written it differently. So it's it's valid choices there. Okay, so we have that answer, and this now, this melody, boom, 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 right? That's the exact same melody that we started with, other than those couple of small adjustments. We go anywhere else in the thing. In the melody, you'll see that it really is pretty literally up a fifth or down a fourth. So after that initial adjustment, everything else from D is down a fourth to A, C down a fourth to G, A down a fourth to E, etc. And here he is using now a real um, the rest of this because he could have kept that in the key and called it E flat. But no, he's like, no, no, no. It was supposed to be a major sixth leap up. So I'm going to make this be a major sixth leap up. Um, and again, that's not necessarily required. Sometimes you would make that be an E flat to keep it more in the original key, but there's nothing wrong. That just makes this be basically a C7 chord here, a, a dominant seventh two chord that will uh, be function as five of five in the original key. So, um, we have that response, and it's following all the way through. Then ba da dum three two one, and then when we come here, you're gonna see it's A G F three two one. Okay, I was singing it in in F, but anyhow, three two one. So it really is literally that same theme, other than that adjustment here. But everything else has been transposed pretty exactly. Meanwhile. The top voice does something new. So it's just harmonizing. These this melody isn't necessarily related to the original melody, but it it captures some of its character. That this that leap down and. B flat A does feel quite related to what's happening here. Bum, ba -dum, and bum, ba -dum. So it there's a sense in which this feels related in some, you know, whatever kind of way. And so that this is what would be called a counter subject. It's officially you call it a counter subject if this melody gets reused, and you don't bother calling it a counter subject if it never gets reused. Uh, Bach does reuse some of this melody later, as you'll see. Um, so he has that going on. And then once that second voice is done, now the third voice enters back mm -hmm. in the original key. And now it's an identical, just down an octave. Right, so it's the exact original melody. So he's brought it in in one voice, then the next voice, then the third voice. Each one does a complete statement of the theme of the subject before the next voice enters. That's part of the tradition of how you start a fugue. And when the third voice enters with that subject, the second voice now 
takes on that counter subject. Bum, ba, da, 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 bum, bum. And here, bum, ba, da, 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 bum. Bum, ba, da, 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 bum. Right? It's the same counter subject, but again, adjusted a little bit in the intervals to make it kind of fit the harmony better. And that's totally legit writing fugues. You don't have to make every single uh, time you reintroduce some little thing, make it be identical. You're allowed to adjust intervals to make it fit the harmony. Because this really should have been So we're back on the original pitch and then up a third. But what he does is Bum, 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 bum. So he went down two sixteenths here. It was supposed to go down one. It was supposed to be down one, then immediately back up. He went down twice and then came back up, right? So it's not the the original counter subject here, but it's quite related to it. And then everything else about it is the same thing. Meanwhile, so the second voice is now taking up that counter subject. And now the first voice is doing whatever else. And what it's doing is pretty typical here. It's getting out of the way. It's getting out of the way because we don't want to get the texture too heavy too soon. Um, we're going to have all three voices at once soon enough. But right now, even though all three voices are in, he doesn't want to bombard us with all three voices. So the top voice has rests. And it has the rest of the C and then D B flat D B E flat ba da ba bum. That little ba da da dum figure is, you know, that's um, I don't know. It's its own little riff, its own little figure that somehow again feels related to something. But if I actually look, do I see that exact pattern of? Ba -da -da -dum. Do you see that exact pattern happening anywhere in the original subject? Well, no, not exactly. Do I see it in the counter subject? No, I don't really. So this little ba -da -da -dum is like a new little motif he introduces. I had to actually check to see, did it exist before? Because... It sounds so in keeping with the character of everything else that I'm actually like, now that I look at it, I'm a little bit surprised to not see it. Um, but, you know, it's it's related. I could say, oh, look, do 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 dum is related to ba da da dum. It's related to the opening three notes, opening four notes of the... Uh, of the subject, it's related to that. It's just not exactly that, right? Um, but that little phrase, the ba da da dum, he then does what's called sequencing. Ba da da dum, ba da da dum, taking that same phrase and taking it up a step. That technique of taking a little phrase and then taking it up a step to sequence it is definitely part of the kind of fugue aesthetic. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, William, there, there, there you go. There is your answer to that. So once that third voice enters, now, by the way, this particular fugue is perhaps a little bit unusual in that if you look at this, the original subject is precisely four measures long. And then the answer is precisely four measures long as well. And then uh, then the the third statement is precisely four measures and then something else happens. And the reason I say that's a little unusual is very typically there will be little extra little bits of connecting material because like here he was able to get it to all work out and be able to come back to a place where he was happy with things harmonically. But look at what's going on when that third voice mm -hmm. entered. He's on the five chord, F, A, C. So he's on the five chord in the key of F, or, I mean, in the, in the key of B flat. <clears throat> if you look at all those E naturals that came before here, he's kind of modulated to the key of F, F. 
So he's only come back to F. He hasn't come all the way back to the key of B flat yet. That is the thing where he chose to say, you know what, that's good enough because my first melody note is going to fit that F chord. In other fugues, he would have said, no, 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 no. I want to bring us all the way back to a one chord in the key of B flat. And he would have stuck in another measure here just to kind of wind back to the original key. So he didn't do that here. So there's words for that. There's what's called a link. There's other terms that are used for when you you do these extra little measures in there. But in this piece, it's um a little bit more uh, just straightforward than that. So once that for, once that third voice is done, that is the end of what we could call the exposition. And again, there's other terms for it, but I like the word exposition because it relates it to sonata form. Um, so that exposition is the, um, and actually I'm forgetting the other terms to be honest, because um, there's at least one other that's probably more common and it's not, not, not uh, coming to mind right now. But um, the idea that you're going to have these three voices enter complete statements, and then if, and then when the when the when the second voice comes in, the thing that the first voice does, we give the name counter subject to, and kind of expect to see that material get reused. Um, so that idea and that that re tone relationship that this was in the original key, the answer is at some level up a fifth or down a fourth. At some level, it relates to the five, either the five chord or the actual modulation to the key of the five, which is kind of what really happens here by the, by the time we start seeing all these E naturals, he's really in the key of F. So, and then the third, the third statement is back to the original key. If there was a fourth statement, it would be back to the key of the five. If there was a fifth statement, it'd be back to the key of the one. So that idea, that you're going to have each theme, each voice come in with the subject is uh, that's, and then at the end of that, you're done with the exposition. This particular one, the voices went straight down the line. It was the highest voice that came in first, then the middle voice, then the lowest voice. That is not especially common, especially in four voice fugues. I think I think I remember seeing a study where someone went through all box fugues and cataloged them and found that order one, two, three, four was like only in like a 15% or some, some small percentage of the fugues and that other orders were more common. And then you could get into thinking about why and there were ended up being some pretty good reasons you could, you could imagine why Bach would have chosen certain voice orders. But he could have come in with the middle voice first, then the top voice, then the bottom, or really any other voice. But again, there's like, when you really get deep into this, you realize there's some orders that are going to work better for you for various reasons. All right, so once he's done with that exposition, now it's much more of a free-for-all. And when I say a free-for-all, I mean, yes, there's going to be imitative counterpoint. So we are going to see that theme show up. So like right here, is, so that's the end, right, of the exposition. That first page gets us through. That's 12 bars. That's three four-bar statements. So starting here is the uh, development section, if we want to relate it to sonata form. And here you can see the top voice comes in with the melody again, but it comes in with a version of the melody that's basically the way it was in the answer here, starting with B flat, B flat, D, B flat, F, A, G, and here, B flat, D, B flat, F, A, G. And he actually gives us a, a complete statement of that uh of that subject here but you don't once you reach this section we don't always expect complete uh statements anymore at once we reach this point what often happens is you bring in the beginning of a subject to say hey there's the subject but then you realize it's not working for you so any so well anymore and you do something else that becomes really common once we reach this section the other thing you might do is just bring in part of it and then say, hey, now I'm going to sequence the thing. So like, oh, and right here, you can see in the bottom part here, um, bum, ba, da, 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 bum, ba, da, bum, 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 right? This is the counter subject. So the counter subject, this, these, this measure right here is almost identical to what happened here 
but the voices are upside down. Here it was the subject was in the was in the lower of the two voices. The counter subject starting with D was in the upper of the two voices. And here it's essentially the exact same thing. He changed it slightly rhythmically here um, for reasons that I actually, oh, I, I'll tell you why he did it because he wanted to change octaves. The original version had D as a dotted eighth and then going right into a 16th, C, B flat. Here, that D was in this octave, but he was like, no, no, I want to get this down into the bottom voice, so I need to drop an octave. So he took it. He took a sixteenth note to do it. D, D. Oh well, I'm, I, I can sing this in the right octave. D, D, C, B flat, A. All right, and so now this is exactly the same thing down an octave from this point. But he's bringing in this ba da ba da, ba na ba na. That's what that is. That's ma na ma na except it's not really. Um, but that wasn't part of this, right? That original monomena didn't come in until we had all three voices sounding. But here, he's like, no, I'm going to use that monomena here. And so he uses it here. That's going to be the name of that thing now, monomena. So you will see now all sorts of places where he just uses little fragments of things. Here's da-da-da-da-da-da-dum, And that little phrase is, you know, that's a phrase that came from do, 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 right? That's a little phrase excerpted from the subject, but now he's using it here, repeating it. But he he does it as a uh, as a sequence. And then. Do, 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 do. And then he brings it in because that's in the middle voice, and now he brings that back down to the bottom voice. Do, 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 So he's using little fragments of that subject and sequencing them, meaning playing it and then playing it again a step higher, a step lower, a third higher, or whatever works. And he's also taking that fragment and moving that fragment between voices. So this is what I mean when I talk about free for all. Or here, bum. Check this out. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, I lost my place. That's not where I'm at. Um, ah, here we are. Uh, why am I not seeing where I'm at? That must be some sort of bug that I'm not aware of. But in any case, there was no stream of eighth notes like this exactly, nor was there any stream of 16th notes like this exactly. And yet, if you look at what's happening, everything that's in here, we've seen before. So this whole thing is a sequence. Now the same thing. Now the same thing. And then again. And he ends his little sequence there. So it's a sequence here. Which is really essentially this kind of thing. Um Ba da da bum ba da dum right it's that basic line kind of elaborated a little bit and then used as a running sequence where he takes that that whole sequence and just says I'm gonna play this a bunch of times in a row. B flat A G F sharp and so he takes that exact sequence that exact phrase and runs it like four times in a row sequencing it each time and the same thing in the left hand this bump bump is basically this figure from the counter subject which is also basically just oh that's basically this inverted I should have pointed that out bum 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 and here in that counter subject we have bum ba da da dum um Right? Da, da, dum, bum. right? This figure in that counter subject is basically this figure inverted. And so he loves to do things like that when writing fugues. So um, uh, does this happen in operas? Well, it certainly happens in, in vocal music in general. It, in fact, that's where these te techniques came from. Uh, Renaissance uh, music 
in particular uh, is just all just full of this sort of counterpoint in not so much with 16th notes, but in quarter notes and, you know, longer note values. But, uh, and, and I've shown some examples of that. In fact, the very first one of these music master classes, we took a look at a, a Renaissance motet. Um, so, uh, doing this sort of thing though, in a, in a choral setting is like, it's, yeah, it, it's a powerful, powerful thing. But the thing to realize is you're never going to understand the lyrics. <laughs> um, when there's different melodies, different rhythms happening at the same time. And then realistically, there'll probably be different lyrics happening at the same time because, <clears throat> you know, one singing one phrase and one singing a different phrase that comes from a different place in the melody. So, it's going to be not really that understandable lyrically. So people typically do this with short, well-known phrases. And so it's really, that's why it was typical for Renaissance, like mass, Renaissance masses, when someone would want to set the mass, uh, the Catholic mass to, to music, they would do things like this. So um, in any case, the, the so I've showed you almost everything that I wanted to show you about this thing, except I want to point out that it is just modulating like crazy. You see the E naturals come in, indicating that he's kind of gone to F, but now you see F sharps coming in, telling me that he's really gone to G minor. G minor. F. And at this point, he's back to G minor with those F sharps. And by the way, just as a little pet peeve, uh, um, sometimes we have this fantasy. It's not a, it's, it's a thing that when we learn about scales, we learn about melodic minor scale as a, as this thing that you play one way on the way up and the other way on the way down. And we sort of imagine that that has some relationship to music. Well, it does, but this shows you it's not a very clear relationship because in G melodic minor, is where you would get the E naturals and F sharps, but we should have them on the way up. And what are we getting? Going down, right? We're getting the G, we're getting the E naturals on the way down, and so it is not that this this idea that we would use the F sharps and E naturals only ascending when we're in G minor. That's just it doesn't reflect the reality of music. Um, the reality of music is far more complex than that. Um, and then, and then here he's got an E flat, and it's it does resolve down, but in any case, so this piece is then kind of, and he's at this point, you know, kind of established G minor as the sort of main tonal area, and that's pretty typical. The thing that I haven't showed you yet that I want to show you is what's called stretto, and stretto is um, uh, when you bring in a statement of the melody of the original subject, and then you bring in another statement of it before the first one finishes. So I'm looking for a statement of the subject, bum, 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 boo, dum. And I'm going to start looking for statements of that subject. And he's going a long ways without one here. Here's one. Bum, 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 bada. Da, 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 ba, ba, so he's introduced it in G minor here. And uh, I don't see that he's introducing a new, another statement of it before this one finishes, but at least there was another statement of it. And that's definitely a thing that you will bring in uh, this, the original subject in a variety of different keys then. I'm looking to see, because now I can't remember, maybe there's not a stretto in this one. Um, because I'm still looking for um, a place where um, um, no. um, right. So here's a here's a statement of the theme of the original subject. But again, I don't see another statement of that exact subject coming in before this one finishes. But if you do, anyhow, it's called stretto. I see again the counter subject here. And there's a whole, um, if you remember, the original counter subject was above the, that subject when it came in, and then later it was below. Well, in order to make that work, you have to do certain things in, in how you write your counterpoint to make sure that 
intervals, like for instance, a perfect fifth is like a good consonant interval, but you flip it upside down. Now it's a perfect fourth. And now that's a little less stable and you have to be a little more careful about how you treat your perfect fourths. And so that's something you have to think about if you're going to write invertible counterpoint is what it's called. You write counter, you write intervals that, oh, this sounds great here, but I have to think about, is it still going to sound so great upside down? Well, it will if I'm careful about what I do after that perfect fifth so that once I flip it upside down, it sounds good. So if I follow that fifth with a sixth, that means when I flip it upside down, it's going to be a fourth followed by a third. And then that's a nice uh, suspension is what we would call that. So um, in any case, um, that basic thing it, it, at this point is just go to town, having fun with all of these techniques, bringing in, here's another, here's another statement of that. And you get to see all these manamanas, manamana, manamana, and da 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 And he loves bringing in that little lick there. And then this little dun 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 da 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 dun 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 dun. That came from the original counter subject. And he loves bringing in that line. That was right here. And you'll see him bringing in that phrase. Uh, anytime you see repeated notes, you'll know that that's what's happened, that he's brought in that phrase again. So it's reusing all the material from the original subject, from the original counter subject, and just putting them in different juxtapositions against each other. What happens if I start it over here instead of instead of starting them at the same time, start them displaced by a couple of beats? Can I make that work? Well, maybe I can if I change a couple of the intervals here harmonically to make it work. And so you do all sorts of crazy things like that just to take the material you have and reuse it in clever ways. That's basically, um, that is basically the gist of, of writing fugues. And then usually at the very end, you have another full statement of the, uh, of the original subject in the original key, but I don't know that he gives us that here. This is in the key of So I'm looking for an original, another statement of B, F, G, F, B flat. And what happened is he gave us this modified version as his final statement. This is the, the, the closest thing we get to a final statement in the original key because it does the original version. Remember the top note there was a B flat. And in his final statement there, it's, so it is essentially the original statement, but again, he fiddled with the first two notes. He made the same modification to the first two notes here that he made in his um, uh, in his tonal answer, the version that he did uh, in his first in his first answer back here where it started on b flat and it kind of outlined a triad it kind of outlined that b flat triad so now he's doing the same thing in his final statement of outlining an e flat triad and then after that he's back to his original so that you know there is no one recipe for building a fugue there's not one specific thing that defines it but Everything that I've told you about here, everything that I've showed you through box example, it, 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 I'm showing you by example what it is to create a fugue. So if I, again, want to define it, it's this piece that uses imitative counterpoint, and it's going to have this exposition in which each voice gets a full statement of the subject, one after another. And then after that is when you start just going to town, playing mix and match and, and using portions of things, dividing them all up, putting them, moving into different keys and doing what, whatever you want. You do that after that exposition. But the plan for the exposition, the original statement, the answer that is kind of in the five, and then the next answer that's back to the one, that basic formula you can expect all the expositions you see in most fugues to follow that form and then after that it's just have fun with those ideas so um uh 
yeah, sing the melody louder. Okay, so that's good to know. Uh, Chris has got some good uh, observations about how to make the melody intelligible in a fugue because, yeah, when there's a lot of things going at once, it's it's tricky, right? So one of the things I mentioned is you pick a simple text that people are going to recognize. Another is you, you do this with the dynamics or you do it with melisma, right? You have only one person actually singing lyrics or one one part actually singing lyrics and the others are ooh, ooh, oohs and there's, you know, there, there are ways of doing that. Um, but it's definitely a more, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger deal to do that in a choral setting than it is on an instrumental setting where people do this at the drop of a hat, introduce a uh, few sections in instrumental pieces. So, um, so, okay, so to contrast fugue and counterpoint, I, I can do that easily. Um, I, I can do that easily by how would I do it? <laughs> I say it's easy. A uh, counterpoint is a much more general term. A fugue is something very specific. A fugue uses counterpoint, but lots of things use counterpoint that aren't fugues. So row, row your boat uses counterpoint, but it's not a fugue. So row, row your boat is row, row, row your boat gently down the row, 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 row. Right? The, the next voice comes in at the same pitch, not a fifth higher, not a fifth lower. It comes in at the same pitch and it comes in before the first melody finishes. Um, so it's already stretto right there. Row, row, row your boat gently on a, and then row, row, row your boat is happening while the merrily, merrily, merrily is going on. So it's row, row, row your boat is using counterpoint and it's doing stretto right away, but it's, it's not a few because it doesn't have these other things going on. It's just, here's a subject and we're just going to repeat it over and over again. That's it. No, none of this fancy stuff. It's just take a subject, repeat it, and, and have two voices at once that are offset, one of them starting a measure later or, or two measures later. So counterpoint is anything that involves having different voices do different things at the same time. Anything. It doesn't even have to be the same. It, like row, row, row your boat. Both voices are doing the same thing, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be, it, it could be two totally different things happening at the same time. As long as there are different things happening at the same time, it's counterpoint. Um, so imitative counterpoint, though, is when the two different things, one is imitating what the previous one did. So a fugue is has counterpoint and it uses imitative counterpoint specifically, but it uses it in this fairly specific way of, OK, I'm going to have a voice. I'm going to have a second voice enter with that same subject transposed after the first subject is done. And then I'm going to have the third sub subject, the third version come in after the second version is going to come. Then I'm going to start combining them in little bits and pieces. Now we're we're taking the idea of counterpoint and playing, doing things with it. But counterpoint is is just like every measure here. I can say, oh yeah, there's counterpoint going on here. There's three separate voices. That's counterpoint. Three different voices doing three different things. That's automatically says it's counterpoint. But it's only a fugue if you add it all up in this way. So um, that is what I would say about. Um, uh, a few things. So, uh, William, I, I, I wanted to give this thing here of really going through this and then, you know, um, I, uh, I actually didn't see if you updated your, 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 your piece to do this, but now that you've seen a, uh, more full, uh, treatment of, of what a, a fugue is and, and my talking through. Now you have some more stuff to think about if you want to keep working on that piece um, and I can come back to it. But what I want to do in, you know, I, I the time left, whatever, I, I have whatever time I have, but I, I actually want to flip over to something completely different. Um, and unfortunately, I lost it. So Frank, are you here? Uh, Frank Paul is... Uh, who I am talking to. So he had posted a nice uh, piece. Let me go to where I can see my comments that people have posted on the scores. He had posted this really cool uh, a piano arrangement of an Elton John piece. Well, you know, Elton John's a pianist, but um, it was it was it was like this big orchestrated thing with you know synthesizers and guitars and and so forth and he had kind of reduced it down to a solo piano thing and i want to talk some about that piece um so there's frank's doing things so i'm stalling while i find the thing um 
cool. All right. So yeah, William, I had checked like yesterday and, and to see if you had uh, done, uh, if you had any uh, um, uh, updates, but I hadn't checked earlier this morning to see. Okay. So um, here's the piece. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to just play you some of this piece and talk through some of what's going on. It's a long piece, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. But um, I want to uh, show you some of what's going on and then talk about, um, I don't know, some of the trade-offs, some of the decisions to make. So I think musically, yeah, I have like very little to uh, quibble with about how uh, Frank has um, chosen to uh, put this together, but I'm just going to play through some different sections of the piece. So the first section is this kind of chorale section, and then it gets a little faster. Yep, we're here, Well, we're, we're from, we're here. So <laughs> this little passage right here. So I wasn't familiar with this piece. I'd heard it, you know, <laughs> years ago. Like, I, I don't think, I mean, the album came out, Yellow, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, uh, I guess in the 70s. I probably didn't hear it till the 80s. But um, and then I went back and listened to it because uh, I couldn't remember the piece, really. Um, and in the original version, this is like, Dah! it's like a synthesized, you know, it, it makes, it's a lot more dramatic. So one of the, the comments that I, I might make is that there's certain gestures that work really well for certain instruments and work differently for different instruments. And so like this passage, as soon as I heard it here, I was like, boy, that sounds awfully odd. I wonder what I wonder what the original was like. And then when I heard the original, I'm like, oh, okay, it's a much more dramatic gesture. So one of the things that one can do in creating a piano adaptation of something that was originally orchestral or electronic or whatever else, or anytime you're taking something that was written for one instrument and adapting it to work with another instrument, sometimes it can pay to deviate from the original in terms of the notes, but try to come up with an equivalent gesture. So like I would claim that if I just did a big glissando with my finger from low A flat, you know, that might be a more dramatic pianistic thing. This is more accurate, but the sound of the uh, was sort of a brassy synthesized kind of sound, as I recall, um, it, it, it worked really well in that context. But on piano, it's nowhere near as dramatic as as that was. So um, that's like a place where you can like choose to do things. Um, oh, oh, corral. So what I mean by corral is essentially the opposite of, of counterpoint. It means all the voices are doing essentially the same thing. We all have dotted quarter, eighth, quarter, quarter. Here, yes, it's quarter, 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 and some people have half notes, some people have eighth notes, but still the overall motion here is a bunch of voices all moving together. It's not independent parts like that Bach piece was. There is some independence in the bass line here, and that's pretty typical that the bass would have more freedom in, especially in any sort of popular jazz rock kind of context, you would expect certain rhythm section instruments to maybe like drums certainly aren't going to just, you know, they might keep a steady pulse and bass is going to do something that's about establishing a pulse, establishing a harmonic structure and so forth. So they often disassociate from the texture. Everyone else might be doing one rhythm and then you might expect bass and drums to have their own thing going on. So, uh, but that's what a chorale is. It's, you know, basically like this whole section is also chorale, all voices moving together, mostly. So it goes through a bunch of different textures. And then there's this big key change here. And actually, let me play you through the key change.
So um, yes, so that uh, so William, yeah, that that's what what I said is is true. Corral really doesn't it doesn't mean anything in specifically beyond what I just said about the rhythm of things moving together. It does connote like a hymn. Uh, uh, something that is a, a religious texture, but you can talk about a chorale section and it means that type of, of uh, arrangement of how the, um, the voices kind of work together, a homorhythmic texture. So um, uh, the thing I was going to comment, uh, so I don't know, Frank, if you are here, but hopefully you'll get to be checking it out later. Um, the observation I make about this key change, so the key change, everything about this is totally in keeping. I mean, it, it's it's a very faithful reproduction of the Alton John original. Um, one thing I will say, though, is you don't typically uh, notate a key change in the middle of a bar. So instead, what I would have done is either notate the key change back here, uh, because this is really starting at the place where I get to hear this E in the bass, and I'm going to have an E7 chord. You know, I got that G sharp happening. At that point, I've really established my key change. I mean, this is the two, five going to one that you expect to see uh, establishing a key change. So I would have put the key signature either there going into this measure, going into the two measures before, right here, or I would have put it right at letter B. So putting it in the middle here, MuseScore does support the ability to do that if you really need it, but I, I generally advise not to do that. Um, okay, so uh, there's all sorts of really nice things going on here. Now, one thing, so pianistically, this texture that's happening in the left hand is this is not playable, right? This is three, my hand isn't that big. Um, I can't reach two, I can't reach three E's at the same time in one hand. And, and this E is too far from, from that E, you know, the, the, the E3 is too far from E5 uh, for me to play both of those in my right hand. So I've got an E5 in my right hand and I'm being asked to play three e, E's in my left and I just can't do it. Furthermore, even passages like this one, I can physically play, I can physically play low A and then A, A, E, A, C, A. I can physically pull that off. However, it doesn't, it, it's, it's going to feel a little bit awkward. I'm not actually going to be holding this A, the low A, the whole three, the whole three beats, because I'm going to have to take my finger off of it and get up to that high C up there. So realistically, this is not how I would probably be constructing that accompaniment. Now, maybe that is the original bass line, or perhaps Elton John on the piano was just playing A, A, E, A, C, A, and wasn't playing the low A also. That was only in the bass, perhaps. So you, you might have to thin some things like that out in order to make them uh, seem like they make sense. So that that's a thing to think about also in how you... Uh, um, uh, in how you do these things. Also, there's this really weird sort of rhythmic thing going on here. So that figure, I feel it's not notated uh, um, in a way that's making sense to me. And and I can tell you why. It's that double dotted sixteenth note. It doesn't make sense. So. One, do dum ba dum. I've heard that rhythm a hundred times. I know that rhythm can be written with nothing but sixteenth notes. Bum, boo dum, ba dum. So I would be subdividing that into sixteenth and be really clear. Like this sixteenth coming after that, oh God, sixty fourth rest. I can't tell by looking at that sixteenth what note it comes in on, but it looks like, oh my God, it must come in a 64th after the beat. But no, that's because the 64th rest is coming after that double dotted 16th. So had that only been written as a 16th, then it would be more clear that this rest is actually a 16th rest. There's a 16th rest on beat four, then the next 16th happens. Or you could have written that as a 16th tied to another 16th. Um, one, do, dom. Actually, it's an eighth. 
what is it? Oh God. See, it's like I, in order for me to even sort out what's happening, it's a 16th tied to another 16th. Um, so I, it's an eighth, but that's because it's a 16th on the E or the A uh of beat three, you tie it to the downbeat of four. You, 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 those two sixteenths you tie together because you don't want to write a, an eighth that kind of straddles a beat a beat like that. So there's all sorts of things you do like that in writing the rhythms to make sure they're readable. Because when I see this, I would freak out and not realize that it's a rhythm I've seen a hundred times, not a hundred times, a, 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 a you know ten thousand times. So there's a, a number of other places where that sort of thing happens, and often. I would say you're better off just not bothering with the rest. So like here, I probably would have taken that as a 16th tied to a 16th and then let this be, let the last uh, thing that you have as a dotted, a double dotted 16th, let that be an actual eighth note rather than a double dotted 16th followed by a 64th. Yeah, maybe there was a slight break in how Elton John, it, John played it on the piano, but not worth notating it. It's That's something that you expect a player to just sort of, decide for themselves how how strongly connected they want the notes to be. So there's any number of places where there's sort of similar things happening of uh, like in this measure here. So this measure bump ba da ba dum ba dum so bump ba da 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 dum I would rather have seen eighth 16th, 16th, rather than 16th rest, 16th rest. Yes, technically it's not the same thing, but isn't it though? Bam, ba da 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 dum versus ba, ba da 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 dum. It's just a question of whether I took a tiny little breath in there. And chances are, I'm going to have to take my hand off that B to get to those octaves anyhow. That little break is going to happen. And boy, if you're really, 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 really wanting to make sure it does, just mark that one as an eighth note staccato to make sure someone comes off of it. But it's not worth uh, obsessing about the note length at the expense of the readability of the music, especially in piano music. It can be a little more so in wind music because that in influences the airstream. But on piano music, the piano start, the note starts decaying as soon as you hit it. So really the length of the note after that it becomes a lot more subjective. Anyhow, every piano is going to sustain a little differently. So it's just often not worth stressing about that. So uh, now it's going into this rhythmic. So I'm going to have the same observation here. Now this rhythm, bum ba dum bum 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 ba dum bum bum I might have chosen to double up the uh, rhythm here, bum ba dum bum 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 ba dum, instead of bum ba dum bum 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 ba dum bum bum. Um, yeah, because this this rhythm requires the use of thirty second notes. It's not like you can't have thirty second notes, but it definitely takes it more into the realm of oh my god, I have to think. To play this, and if you just wrote the tempo out twice as fast, then this this rhythm would have reduced into something with nothing more than sixteenths. If you are going to use thirty seconds in this context, I am going to um, suggest that you break up. Like these are all on one beam, and it's actually that's that is not. I don't think MuseScore would have done it that way by default. I think you might have had to. Uh, set that or no maybe you maybe it does by default but on a complicated rhythm like this if you have nothing but a stream of 30 seconds then okay fine you can beam them all in in a big grouping whether it's a full beat or even two full beats but um this pattern i guess it's because of the eighth and the 16th that it thought it could get away with it i don't know but um uh i would be breaking that beam so i would be using muse score to break that beam pattern. Oh, I don't even have music score loaded right now. Look at me. Oh yeah, I do. Um, so uh, in fact, let me just enter that pattern real quick. Uh, dotted 16th, 32nd, 3 dot C, and then a 32nd, and then uh, a 16th, 8th, 16th. 16th, 8th, 
16. Yeah, so it did meme them all together. But when I look at this, I can't tell how this all relates to the B. So, you know, you're going with MuScore's default here, and um, that's okay. That, uh, I mean, it's usually it's safe to go with the defaults, but it's not always. So if you had broken the beam right here at the halfway point, um, in fact, let me get back to my uh, <clears throat> more standard kind of arrangement here. Um, the beam properties palette here would allow you to break the beam right there. Now, this isn't exactly right either, though, because um, I have to think about this, right? Um, this is only half a beat here. So it, it's really hard for me to actually conceive of what this rhythm is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I said and double it up. So watch this. I'm going to copy and then paste double duration. Ha! Ah, now I can see what this rhythm is. Bum ba doom bum 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 ba do dum bum, and this quarter shouldn't really be written this way either, because this is on the end of two carried over. This should actually be now an eighth tied to an eighth. Ha! Ah, now I can read this thing. Now this is a rhythm I recognize. Right? It's the same rhythm. Bum ba doom bum bum, and I can see beat one. I see beat two. I see beat three and I see beat four. I see all four beats very clearly. And this one note that straddled the middle of the measure, I went ahead and broke it as a tie. So that would have been this thing should have been broken as a 16th tied. Tie that one over. And now if I break my uh, beam here, uh, this now is, it's still not really, it's, yeah, I, I, now I can actually beam these guys together if I want. I can I can undo that. Just doing this, bum ba do bum bum. I can see where that beat is now, right? Um, so just breaking that up, I can see that this is all one beat, and this is one beat, and that wasn't clear in the default beaming. So that's MuseScore's. I would put that on a on MuseScore to say no, it should have done a better job. But it's we thought out the beaming pretty well for eighths and sixteenths, but we didn't think it out so well for thirty seconds. So you have to you have to do some of the thinking. But I would also just say that I don't want to read this anyhow. I'd much rather read this and have a faster tempo. So um, that's what I would be rec recommending there. And then all these sixteenths would become eighths, similar. So isn't the quarter on the end of two more acceptable? Um, I would say. If it is a simple enough rhythm, like this rhythm right here, I am absolutely positively okay with. Boo dum bum bum bum. That's a fine rhythm. I'm totally okay with that one. Also, if you're doing if you're doing a lot of Latin music, um, then this bum 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 is considered okay. We feel this in two anyhow. That's sort of a, a club, half of a clave rhythm, right? So there are certain contexts in which certain exceptions, I think, are, are legit. There's any time, though, where there's even the slightest doubt, err on the side of doing what I did here, of breaking it up. That's my personal advice anyhow. So, um, uh, uh, so those are some of my observations. And then he, and then we get to see that same rhythm here. And it's like this interesting kind of slowing down. Right, it's that passage kind of, this is like a notated, uh, rubato or not even rubato it, it's like a rallentando it's dun 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 it's just the same rhythm slowing down it might have actually been more to the point to just write it out the same way with a rallentando on it and then adjust the tempo you know through tempo markings maybe um i i, I would have to listen to it the original to see if he really is literally keeping to exactly this or not, but that's that is uh, just an observation I would have. And but then the similar thing, this bum 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 um, yeah, that combination of how those beamings work, I'm sure it adds up right, but it doesn't read very well. And so if this was written out, like here's dotted sixteenth, dotted sixteenth, and then sixteenth, that would be analogous to what I just showed here of dotted quarter, dotted quarter, quarter. So 
if you took this and just broke up that eighth into two sixteenths, I would be more likely to recognize that rhythm. But you can also then break it up into individual beats, which really I would have recommended. Um, so yeah, that's what's happening. And then we uh, come into another section with more. This, I again would rather see staccato eighth notes than uh, than 16th and 16th rest because it, it's just like too much to read. And then we have other passages that are just really straightforward. This all feels really good. The same thing goes on here. The rhythm, the way the rhythms are written out, I want to see each beat really clearly. So I can see A, A, that's a, a quarter, that's one beat. So this note is on the beat. And then the 16th and half of that A are, are on beat two. So this A here needs to get broken up into two. So bomb, bomb. Uh, 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 um, so that second one, two, and then this is on. So one, two, e, and ah, uh, boom, bam. So the, 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 this eighth note that you have that tech comes in on the two, e, and ah, uh, uh, you, you would want to write it as a 16th, then tied to another 16th. So that second 16th would line up with beat three very clearly. And then, then we would see the next 16th and the eighth note. So that would improve the readability of that rhythm also. Um, and yeah, and that rhythm kind of carries on throughout. And it's a, really a variation of the same rhythm that we saw earlier, but here it's written with 16ths instead of 30 seconds. So it's um, going to be clearer. And uh, yeah, the, the, the arrangement goes on and it has all these different sections to it because that's what the piece has. Um, but it's, it's all very well done in the sense of like reducing this large scale piece into something playable on the piano. And kind of a final delicate section. In the original recording, this goes on longer. Well, it, it, it's it he he took some liberties with the actual like at, it, for the first like three minutes of the piece, it's like measure for measure exact. And at some point, he's like, "Well, I'm gonna cut out some like extended vamps where there's like soloing, and I'm gonna simplify it." And so at some point, it becomes a shorter version than the actual original, which was over ten minutes long. So this, I, I I don't even remember, but ding, 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 that staccato uh, thing in thirds, I'm totally hearing that as like some sort of synthesized thing with uh, like a, 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 a like a, an electronic effect making that happen. Uh, that is being conveyed nicely <laughs> through the staccato piano notes, and so I I don't remember for sure that that's what that sound is, but I'll bet it is. And if so, I think you conveyed it really, really nicely and play these last few measures out. Okay, so um, uh, there you go. So this, um, yeah, I think Frank just, and, and Frank was saying that, you know, that he's really new to using MuseScore. He's new to a lot of things about uh, writing music. He's got his comments here. So let me um, actually just post this in the chat if someone wants to give him some feedback. Um, I'm posting this in the chat. So everything's playable. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it, the computer can play just about anything, right? But yeah, what, what's playable on piano is um, always uh, you know an issue. What's actually playable with the hands, and so it takes some amount of experience with the instrument to get good at writing for really any instrument. And often, if I'm writing for an instrument that I don't play, I'll just talk to someone who does play it, uh, give them samples of it, and say, "Hey, how how playable is this? What what would what would uh, is there anything that's so hard to play that it needs to be written or are there ways that I could rewrite it in a way that would be easier to play without sacrificing too much. But that's the part that they want to usually simplify it too much. And I'm like, no, no, I want the, I want this and I'll make them do something hard anyhow. Um, 
So anyhow, that's uh, sort of the stuff that I wanted to show you today. And I think what I'm going to be doing is getting that, because I really enjoy being able to go deep enough into these pieces that I look at, that if I spend some time doing a, a demonstration of my own and then get deep into one piece, that's always more than enough time. So that's, you know, I think that's going to be kind of the format. So if we, we might expect there to be kind of one piece that I focus on, unless there's like a couple of smaller pieces. So some weeks I might pick one big piece to focus on, some, piece, some weeks I might pick a couple of smaller pieces. Some weeks my demonstration might be shorter also. Um, Cause yeah, I want to, I want to keep these a manageable length. Um, uh, but you know, I know you guys are just like eating lunch or making coffee or doing homework or whatever else you're doing and listening in the background. And that's great. So um, I'm going to sign off and uh, I hope everyone has a great week. And uh, just, I encourage you submit more music, upload it, add it to the, add it to the group on uh on musecore.com so that uh i can see that it's there and uh offer you my comments so yeah every week i'll try to pick one main piece to focus on or a couple smaller pieces and do some sort of presentation and uh hope that you all enjoy what's going on and i certainly enjoy doing these so again visit my site sign up for the mailing list sign up you know by enrolling in the music master class which puts you on the mailing list for it um and by all means, check out the other courses if you're interested in learning more about harmony and so forth. Got lots of lots of stuff for you there. So that's my commercial. Um, hope everyone's having a great a great week and continues to do so. And uh, will I will see you next time.